Hello and welcome to this very special stream brought to you by Gaming Alexandria. My name is Ethan Johnson, I'm the editor for Gaming Alexandria, and today we are going to be looking at one of the magazines that we have scanned and going through it page by page, talk a bit about the history and events that were going on in this issue of Video Games and Computer Entertainment in September of 1991. This special reading is brought to you by you, because you helped fund uh, some stuff that I was doing out in San Diego. I needed to acquire some court documents, which required funding, and we got a very nice amount of funds for the project, so thank you very much to everybody who participated in that. And today we are going to see the fruits of, uh, well, it was a promise before I, uh, put down that we needed these funds, we were going to do a reading from a magazine. Now, nobody actually ended up voting for what the magazine was going to be, so I had a choice. And I decided to choose this 1990s issue because I thought it would be fairly interesting, and it turned out, even though I just kind of picked it at random, I was correct. So we are going to get right into the whole deal with video games and computer entertainer entertainment for September of 1991. We are viewing this in a CBZ format, which is uh, commonly used in magazine scanning. Uh, we upload to the to archive.org in both PDF and CBZ format in a lot of cases. So depending on what sort of viewer is most to your taste. You can, you can have it all, and then some. Video games and computer entertainment, and the feature game is The Rocketeer for NES, Super NES, and computer platforms. I've never seen the actual movie of The Rocketeer. It sounds like something that I would enjoy, but I just never have had the chance to see it. It was one of those big action sci-fi kids movies that kind of flew under the radar but is, you know, cult classic beloved today, like The Navigator, or things like that. Flight of the Navigator, I should say. I'm very bad at this. One thing I thought was interesting on this cover, just to start off, is actually they were selling it in three different regions, the US, the Can Canada, and the UK. And there's an editorial in here where they ask some things about the, uh, about whether or not they should restrict their coverage. Because Britain had its own gaming scene and, and such, and, so, you know, sometimes it was interesting to hear about games that were abroad, and then, you know, they might have the possibility of being brought over. But, in a lot of cases, it was kind of irrelevant to UK-specific uh, stuff, even though they tried to cover it. So, there's a question in the editorials here of whether or not they should even bother. So that is the front cover, and of course, all these things we are going to be reading about in the magazine. Nintendo, Sega, NEC, Atari, IBM, Apple, Commodore, and Amiga. I'm not sure how much stuff there really is. There's nothing Amiga-specific, I think, in this entire thing. Just ports and stuff for Amiga, but let us move on. And our first page is a double-page spread of NASCAR for the Game Boy and NES. It's, um... Bill Elliott's NASCAR Challenge on the NES and then NASCAR Fast Track on the Game Boy by Konami. Of course, NASCAR games are popular in the US and nowhere else. Uh, and this particular... I, I have no idea if it's a series or not. I just kind of looked this up. Oh, there's even an LCD game. Oh, they, they're, they're getting real fancy up in here for a given value of fancy, I guess. But the interesting thing about these uh, these games here is that the kind of gimmick of the, the racing, it's a first-person uh, racing game, but with sprite scaling and whatnot. The gimmick of the racing is that you control where the... Cur you control a cursor on top of the wheel that will show you how much you're turning in that direction. So you're not just going by feel of how much you're pushing to the left or right on the D-pad, it kind of has a direct visualization. And of course it has pit stops and all this kind of stuff. 
basic NASCAR game things. It's pretty much a direct port, but I assume they just didn't have the rights on the handheld to have the Bill Elliott name on it. So it's a, you know, clunky first-person racer on the Game Boy and NES. By far not the most impressive on either of those systems. And ultimately, you know, it's something that just has a good amount of marketing to mask the fact that they didn't spend a whole lot of time on the game. It's a, it's a kind of interesting ad, but other than that, not much to say. On page four, we have Back to the Future 3 for 16-bit computers, and I think it was, it was ported to SNES later, I can't remember. But the uh, this game was actually, it, it has the Konami label on it, but it was actually developed by Mirrorsoft, which I thought was interesting, because I didn't really know how much uh, development power Mirrorsoft had, but apparently enough that uh, Konami was putting their, putting their name on <laughs> these very bad games. So the entire playthrough of this game, if you don't die, is 13 minutes. So this is one of those games that's just hard for the sake of it, to extend out the playtime. And it doesn't even look that good. The mi- like, most of the, the, you know, there's a couple mini games. There's one of those games that's just kind of built on top of mini games, kind of in the Cinemaware m model. Which is, uh, ironic, we're going to be talking about Cinemaware later, and Mirasoft uh, did publish some Cinemaware games in the UK. But the main game you're going to be playing is this one where you have uh, Doc uh, Brown leaping over these chasms and avoiding obstacles on a horse. Which, you know, is the, the big climax of the movie and everything. But it is just, you know, it's just a, a test in memorization, and once it's done... You got, you got really nothing else that you're, you're doing in this game. It's really nothing to, uh, to write home about, even as far as bad games go. It's really just a whole lot of nothing. But it has the Back to the Future name on it, so... I guess that's of some interest. It's, yeah, don't, don't even bother. Don't check it out. So we get to the contents page, and uh, something that you will notice, especially if you follow me on Twitter at GameResearch underscore E, you will see that a lot of these names look very familiar. Joyce Worley, and uh, Frank Tetro Jr., and Arnie Katz. These are many of the same editorial staff who, back in the day, started Electronic Games, the first console video game focused magazine back in late 1981. So actually we've gone past the anniversary of the first issue of Electronic Games. So 10 years later, they are writing for video games and computer entertainment. And they bring a lot of their editorial style over if you pay attention to that sort of stuff. I generally don't, but uh, looking at these magazines long enough for details, you're gonna pick some of that stuff up. So on the editor page, so the, uh, you know, the, the main people behind, um, electronic games aren't doing the main stuff with the, you know, it, they aren't editing the magazine, but they are, uh, contributing, and you can see all the, the various things over here. Of course, you can view this, uh, magazine by going to GamingAlexandria.com, and you can look under our magazines page, and you'll see the September 1991 issue of Video Games and Computer Entertainment. So this uh, editorial, written by Andy Eddy, is mainly just kind of a thing about publication. And like I said at the front page, he's wondering exactly how much they should be writing for stuff on, on an international basis, because this is a U.S.-focused magazine even though it's being sold in Canada and the UK. But so they're they're wrestling with that. They don't really know what to do. I think it does eventually just kind of consolidate and, you know, they'll talk about a little bit of uh, stuff here and there. But generally, it's, a, it's just a, you know, musing on, on publication matters, not anything particularly interesting about the video game industry as such. If you like following video game editors 
and things like that, then I'll, I'll power to you, but I honestly don't care what reviews and editors have to say <laughs> in many cases. So I'm not going to point out when, uh, you know, somebody, he gave this a score of this, but he gave that a score of that, uh, which some other people uh, might do. But that is not, that's not my dig. I want to look at the information here, talk about the stories that were going on in the video game industry at the time. And we have Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure for the NES, published by LJN. Not one of their worst titles, but that is not saying a lot for anything that was published under LJN. LJN was, of course, just a label used by Acclaim to dump their very poor quality games, mostly their movie licensed games, though a couple movie licensed games did also come uh, out under Acclaim as well. But Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure for the NES has a very uh, CRPG feel. If you've ever played a CRPG from the late 80s, especially the DOS ones, you will get a distinct feeling out of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure for the Nintendo Entertainment System. So, if you go into this one, just be prepared that you're gonna, you're gonna find something a little bit odd about everything. Uh, it's not, it's definitely one of those games that is not made to be a console game, but it has kind of a nice humor to it, and, you know, it's not, it's not bad. So, uh, this next page is Docs, Nintendo peripherals for, uh, NES and Game Boy. So I don't know a whole lot about Docs in particular, it's just one of these companies that sold accessories, which the accessory market was really, really big in, like, 1989. Even almost as big as the games market on uh, Nintendo systems. So there were a lot of people who got into that. Uh, I did hear some interesting stories, not about this company in particular, but, you know, th these peripherals, they're made in, like, Hong Kong and Taiwan, you know, cheap manufacturing places, and they don't do a whole heck of a lot. They are not very good products. And in a lot of cases, there's a lot of scumminess that comes into the peripheral market. One particular thing I heard from a fellow named Dom Reisinger, who was a marketing man first at Amiga and then at Sega of America back in the, um, the, the early period when they were selling the Master System. He later went on to form his own company selling uh, peripherals for console systems. And he told this very interesting story about how Mad Cats, yes, that Mad Cats, ripped off some of his peripherals and sold them, you know, just the same, but with their own branding and everything. And, you know, I don't have full corroboration on that, but it does not at all surprise me. Uh, a, a company that's just kind of funneling cheap whatevers out of Hong Kong and whatnot, yeah, it's gonna be a little scummy. Can't say anything specifically about docs, but I thought that was an interesting story. Now this page is the fun page. So this page is a notification that Nintendo has lost a lawsuit with the United States government. So back in 88 or 89, the uh, there were several investigations going on against Nintendo. Uh, Tengen, Atari Games, was suing Nintendo over um, unfair competition practices because they wanted to be able to produce unlicensed software for the NES. Atari Corp was suing Nintendo over uh, antitrust practices, uh, saying that because of Nintendo's way of doing business, Atari Corp with the 7800 and the 2600 Junior were not able to get a hold in the market, that Nintendo was excluding them by pressuring retailers to do stuff. Then there was an investigation by the SEC, specifically into Nintendo, whether or not they were price-fixing. Um, by uh, making it so that retailers could not lower the price of the NES or else they would be penalized. And then there was a suit by most of the 50 states. I don't think it was actually all of the 50 states. But they did a simultaneous uh, suit on uh, December 7th, uh, I think it's 1989, which uh, was very much a deliberate thing to coincide with Pearl Harbor. It was a fight back against the Japanese. It's all wrapped up in this um, anti-Japanese sentiment in the late 1980s. But these, 
the states and District of Columbia and, um, of 48 other states. I know one of them was Alaska, so it wasn't that it was the contiguous states. Uh, so I think to, like two just decided not to participate. But most of the states filed a simultaneous suit against Nintendo for uh, monopolistic practices. And uh, the investigation went on, and they found violations in this regard. Uh, there's not a lot of specifics on exactly what it was, but the, the settlement, as noted here, is if you purchased a Nintendo product um, between June 1st, 1988 and December 31st, 1990, you were entitled to a $5 coupon on another Nintendo product. And this could effectively cost Nintendo a lot of money. If everybody who had that redeemed their card, you know, they had to put this stuff in the magazines and the newspapers and everything. So people knew about it. But not everybody really got it, and there was a time limit on, yeah, you have to do it by September 19th, 1991. And this is going out in September 1991. So this is the last chance that you had to redeem this thing. And this is just, this isn't actually the coupon. This is notifying you, you can get the coupon. So if you got like expedited shipping and everything, you might be able to get it. They mailed them out to a bunch of people and everything. But effectively, this didn't help anything in terms of punishing Nintendo, because all it did was encourage people to buy more stuff, and they were making way more than $5 off of everything that they sold. So this was possibly the worst antitrust settlement in history. Uh, it was a complete joke, and Nintendo laughed all the way to the bank with this. I have no idea how they were able to convince the judge that this was the proper way of doing everything. And they had to pay some money out to the states and stuff. It wasn't even like a hundred thousand, or it wasn't even like a million dollars or anything. No, this was such a minor antitrust case. It didn't mean anything, really. So, I just thought that this was a, yeah, this is, this is one of those great moments where you show that no matter... No matter what you do, you can't put Nintendo down. All right, mail time. Sometimes mail is interesting, and sometimes it's really not. So, this uh, first letter is a guy who is very angry over the reporting of the Tengen v. Uh, Nintendo case. Um, he basically uh, is trying to, um, actually to the, the people at Video Games Computer Entertainment. Um, I forget who is actually answering this. Um, I do not know. But, yeah, they... So, there, there's a response to this, basically, that um, this guy, whoever, whoever this John Lucas is, that... Thanks for your letter, John, and here it is in its entirety. We're not sure who has given you inside... Who you know inside Tengen who has given you these facts, but we have to dispute them. So, they're, they're basically defending their journalistic integrity. And some of these things are correct, and some of these things are not really quite correct. Um, Tengen didn't get a license to produce NES games simply to acquire uh, the technology. You know, that... Uh, well... It's, that I mean, it, it's a little up in the air on that uh, because they, uh, like, according to the court case, they had been trying to reverse engineer the NES before they got a license to the NES. So they seem to have done it out of capitulation, but then later they went back on their thing and they said they were being sued by Nintendo and all that stuff. Tengen never fabricated the story that Nintendo threatened retailers, though it did help the U.S. congressman who investigated Nintendo. These results later turned over to the Federal Trade Commission, who uh, we feel were doing a poor decision by doling out its punishment. And that punishment was the thing on the prior uh, page. Um, so, they, like, the editorial staff in general is very against Nintendo. And I'm not saying there's not a lot of stuff to be against Nintendo for. I'm just saying that they're against Nintendo. Um, 
And they're, they're trying to make the point that Tengen was kind of in the right to do the things they did. But I mean, on the le on the legal standpoint, they ha like they really didn't have a case of being discriminated against when they did those uh, very unsavory things with the law that you're not supposed to do. Um, system exclusivity has until recently been per perpetuated by Nintendo. Only now we're seeing the situation that exists in the PC software market and Japanese video game markets where game titles are crossing over to other systems. Now, when we're talking about exclusivity here, we are talking about the clause in the contract that says that if you develop a game for the Nintendo Entertainment System, you cannot port that game to another system um, yourself within three years. Um, there are a lot of ways to get around this. For instance, Double Dragon appears on the Atari 7800. So they license, they did a sub-license to Atari to make a game uh, based on Double Dragon for the 7800, but they weren't violating the Nintendo contract because they weren't doing it themselves. And that's a weird thing to do, and yeah, this is probably the worst thing that Nintendo did. There really is no justification for it. Other than we don't want you competing on other systems. The, a lot of the other things like restricting supply and making sure that manufacturers didn't overload the market with games and all that stuff. You can find justification for it whether or not you think it's convincing. But the idea of you cannot make a, um, a title for the NES and then put it somewhere else is very anti-competitive. And so that is definitely something that they're in the right to complain about. Also, we have uh, Cryon Conquest for the NES. And this is one of those late-stage NES games that's like uh, Little Samson, and it is to a T influenced by Mega Man. It is, one, it is the most Mega Man, not Mega Man game you will ever play. And I'm sure a lot of people know this, but I didn't know this. I didn't know until I looked at it. And it is just like, yeah, stage by stage, enemy by enemy, um, Mega Man. It has, like, some, some cool features and whatnot, and it kind of has a magical theme, but you're fighting robots and everything, but yeah, like, look at this. Look at this screenshot. You do not need to look at this screenshot very long to know that this is basically Mega Man. And the style is basically identical. I mean, it looks kind of fun, uh, but it is Mega Man. Also on this last, uh, thing here, uh, they mention that, or actually, yeah, so, uh, by the way, we don't think the NES will take the over the video game industry, as you may expect. With the announcement that the Genesis will now have Sonic the Hedgehog bundled with the system, um, we don't feel that Ninte Nintendo's new entry will eradicate anyone right away. Of course, that's simply our early opinion. So, Sonic just came out, and they're already seeing it as kind of a game changer. And as it turned out, that's exactly what it would be. So in this next letter, um, this guy Nick Smith of Advanced North Carolina uh, talks about, uh, like, he, he says in a very confusing way of uh, whether he feels like, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> we're confused about what you're accusing us, being too dedicated to the older systems or being too dedicated to newer systems. And... The, the person who answers this question gets very snippy about it, and I think that's that's just a little, it's, it's a little bit fun. Um, this next uh, thing, they are talking about the Genesis, and of course, as was demonstrated in the first letter, they really want to take down Nintendo in a lot of ways. But when they're asked about the question of what is there out, uh, what is out there for the Genesis that really shows it off, they have no other response than Sonic the Hedgehog. There, there were some pretty cool early Genesis games. I like Genesis games. But there really wasn't anything that was showing off what the Genesis was other than Sonic the Hedgehog. And I don't think there's really that much in, like, 1992 either. You have to wait until, like, 1993 and 1994 to get, like, really impressive new stuff that you wouldn't see on the Super Nintendo or the Genesis. So I just, uh, you know, I, I think it's an interesting disparity between the two libraries. When the SNES launches, you have Castlevania 4. 
And that is just a game that completely blow, like shows off everything that it can do. You could, you could say stuff like F-Zero, but that really pales in comparison to Castlevania 4. So Genesis really doesn't have anything at the moment, but there, no, there's time. So, uh, the, uh, this caller asked if there's any good, uh, action-finding games for the Turbo Graphics, uh, and there really isn't, even though they say, you should check out Fighting Street. Fighting Street, the, uh, weirdly named, uh, port of Street Fighter 1. Uh, it wasn't good in the arcade, and it's not good on the Turbo Graphics. Don't play Fighting Street. And the final letter here talks about the Battletech Center. So in a previous issue, unfortunately, we haven't scanned it yet because we haven't received it. But uh, in the May 1991 issue, they do a, a thing on the Battletech Centers. And for those of you who don't know, the Battletech Center pods were these wraparound arcade games where you would sit back into a chair and you would be doing a... Me it's a Mech Warrior game. It's based on that franchise by um, FASA, uh, a corporation based in Chicago, uh, and you would sit back in these pods and you'd be piloting, piloting a mech and battling people. And these were like some of the first experience arcade games because of the full immersive stuff. It wasn't virtual reality, but you had these big screens up in front of you that would come down over these pods and you'd be controlling in these big giant things and everybody was separated. So this was a very feature attraction. Uh, and I had a teacher who uh, helped on these. He was mainly a tabletop guy at the time, but he is uh, Tom Dowd, who is a longtime uh, member of FASA, uh, and also worked on stuff like Shadowrun and uh, Vampire the Masquerade, the tabletop rule sets. And later on at Microsoft, uh, when FASA was bought by Microsoft, he went on to work on some of the Battletech and Mech Warrior games that uh, were done on the Xbox and the Xbox 360. Look them up on movie games sometime. But he told uh, when VR was coming back, you know, when the Oculus and the Vive were starting to be a big thing in the 2000s, he told me this very interesting story about the Battletech centers that were over on Navy Pier here in Chicago. He said that they had these Battletech pods uh, set up and everything, and they had kind of this dedicated space on Navy Pier that they were doing it. And on the one side they had these Battletech uh, pods, like eight of them, and then on the other side they had about three stations for virtuality. Virtuality were the first kind of virtual reality games. So it looks a lot like an Oculus headset, though it's way bigger, and you'd be kind of running in place inside this little um, circular dome like that, that treadmill thing that is not gone anywhere. And you'd be kind of wishing your head around and, and like, it, it would look stupid. But the Battletech pod centers would look awesome. So he was like, VR is not going to take off because when you look at it, it just looks stupid on the outside. Whereas, you know, these full immersion games were, you know, something that was really cool and futuristic and really seemed more like a, a fun, interesting experience. And, you know, that that is yet to be seen. Uh, I mean, there are games that are kind of in the Battletech Center mold, like that Star Wars uh, one that I've seen at a lot of arcades recently. But yeah, not a lot of VR arcades out there, as much as they've tried. They've been trying since, so they've been trying since the early 90s, and then the early 2000s they tried again, and now, you know, nobody's going to arcades right now, so you can't really push it on that front. But yeah, the Battletech Centers were a very cool thing. Um, and if you uh, are interested in some of that, you can look up Mr. Talita on Twitter, for he knows a lot about FASA Corporation. So the next uh, game that we have up is Aerostar for the Game Boy. Uh, it's a basic sort of shmup, and it even has basically Gradius-style uh, lettering for its logo and everything. But actually, it has very detailed art for the Game Boy. It's one of those uh, games that have, like, they use the gradations really well. It, it only really, it, it looks way better on an actual Game Boy screen 
than it does, you know, on a pure, pure black and white facsimile and everything. So definitely check out Aerostar sometime uh, if you're interested in seeing just some, like, very early, very good Game Boy art. It's nothing special. It's a top-down uh, shmup. Next up, we have the tip sheet. So this is where uh, people would ask if, uh, you know, the, the editor's new secret codes or general uh, tips of how to get through a game. And it's kind of a, an interesting thing, especially this first one here. So this guy's asking if he can get 98 men, which are extra lives, on uh, Bad Dudes, which of course is a uh, classic for the NES. Are you a bad enough dude to rescue the president? We'll see. But he uh, is asking about 98, and maybe it rolls over at, at 98. Sometimes it's a weird thing like that. It doesn't even go to 99, or it will roll over to 1. Or, so, or sometimes the lives are limited. But uh, they say this is a way you can get 64 extra lives. And it's an interesting thing just as, like, the colloquialism. Like, maybe he, maybe he was thinking about 98, but... Uh, it might be that the 64 code got modulated into 98 when it was passed through people who like, oh, I know this code. It gives you max lives and everything. So this question tells you a little something about how these tips and stuff were going out. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the tips and stuff later. But I'm sure nobody misses the uh, passwords as safe states stuff. So on this game, Casino Kid, here's how you get to the, the final last, um, the, the, the final couple of opponents to actually win the game. But nobody liked writing these down and nobody liked typing them out. So I'm glad that they're gone. Hell, hell with passwords, up with batteries. And then uh, there's just like this huge amount of stuff asking for tips on, on Legend of Zelda, uh, which is a super old game at this point, but people are still asking about it. So they have all these letters that they answer all together, and it just, you know, it's cheaper than the Nintendo hotline. You, you just have to hope that they answer it, but, you know, they... <laughs> But you don't have to call into a paper paper line hotline. So, you know, may, maybe a more efficient way of doing it if you're really that stuck. Though, you know, there's also the uh, ability of asking your friends and all that if you have friends to go to. Also on this page, we have uh, advertisements for the Quick Shot series of controllers. Um, which are, you know, they're not compatible in most systems, but they are compatible with Sega, Atari, Commodore, MASX, and Amstrad systems, which all have one thing in common. They all use the 9-pin connector that was first used on the Atari VCS. Well, I don't know if it was first used there, but that is where the 9-pin connector comes from. So it's basically the Atari connector. Uh, and the Genesis used it and Commodore systems used it. Unfortunately, we don't know a lot. So it's basically the USB of its day. It doesn't have a lot of functionality, so it's not doing the same sort of thing as USB. But it has enough functionality that you can read in, you know, a couple of simple button presses and directions and all that. But I, I, I really wish that we knew more about the 9-pin connector. Because the person who designed it appears to be dead. So can't ask him. So, next up, we have Bardstale Construction Set. Prepare to enter a wondrous world of adventure created by the ultimate Game Master. You! Of course, you have to use Game Master, because Dungeon Master is copyright TSR Wizards of the Coast 1974 or whatever it came. I, I, I don't know. But, yeah, this is an MS-DOS program that allows you to create uh, mazes and maps and adventures in general that uh, play like The Bard's Tale by Interplay. And this is a very, um, it, it, like, it, it's one of the, the best programs of its kind. There was this very uh, big boom in the mid to late 80s of construction sets after 
uh, Bill Budge's pinball construction set, set became a thing. Uh, and there were a lot, they dropped for a lot of things. They did Gold Box series games later, and yeah, it, w it was a craze for a while, but it was just, y you couldn't share them very easily. I mean, you could save them to a disc and everything, but it just wasn't the same sort of thing as modding today. Uh, but you could create a very elaborate adventure, your own sort of thing, and it's ki kind of, they would put this out when they were like, oh yeah, we're not going to be doing this kind of game anymore, so like, just let players do it themselves. And it'll be interesting to know a bit more about that uh, side of things, because there is definitely, uh, well, you know, the, the, to talk about the, uh, find your words. To talk about the fa the uh, the scene behind a game like Bardstale Construction Set, because a lot of other games have had this stuff covered before, but this one's particularly interesting because it's it's just a very expansive program. All right, now it's time for news, my favorite part. And first up, we have Nintendo's Philips deal just dropped. So. This is reporting on the uh, summer CES in at the beginning of June, uh, so this is a little late, but they s say that by Christmas of 1993, Nintendo and Philips will have worked out a deal to create a CDI-based platform. And they say some final, like, almost like any, other, any report that came out like right after the event happened uh, has basically no details. But this report actually has a couple details. Um, yeah, at a major press conference uh, the next day, Nintendo Vice President Peter Main stunned a room full of journalists with the announcement that Nintendo had struck a deal with Philips Electronics NV. They were only uh, surprised if they didn't read the New York Times that morning, which had a, or uh, the day earlier, which had a report on this uh, Nintendo that Nintendo was no longer going with Sony. And it actually affirmatively states that the uh, Nintendo of America executive stressed that his company will not support the Sony PlayStation. So this is a direct shot across the bow. This isn't just a, oh, we're vacillating on whether or not we're doing one or the other. No. <laughs> Sorry. No. They are not going to support the Sony PlayStation. They are putting their full thing behind Nintendo. And they also say that Nintendo... Uh, that it appears likely that Nintendo will also support Philips' forthcoming CDI machine. Uh, but that is speculation. They And they may have seen some of the ads that show like the Donkey Kong stuff and whatnot. But of course, that was a direct license to Philips. It, had, it, was, it was not actually... Nintendo actually doing any development on the CDI, they probably would have killed themselves. Uh, so, big biggest news of this entire issue, uh, right up in center. Next up, we have Disney. Disney getting into games for the third time, something like that. Nint Disney has a vacillating relationship with games. They get really interested, and then they try to go big, and then they're like, oh, this is hard, and then they get out. And currently, right now, we're in an out period. They um, they got out after uh, Disney Infinity, which was their attempt at doing something in the Skylanders uh, style. But at this time, they were really trying to have a go at personal computer software. Uh, not so much the console software, they were still just licensing stuff for that. So they have this uh, sort of educational game based uh, with Roger Rabbit on the Amiga, of all things. And DOS as well, but it definitely looks more like an Amiga game. Um, I mean, very impressive for uh, the, the, the time period, considering that it, you know, a lot of these licensed games don't get a whole lot of time. So, Hair Rising Havoc, and also they mentioned down here, the Disney Sound Source. The, the Sound Source was one of the cheapest, earlier, earliest alternatives to a sound card that you could get in a DOS computer. It was an actual speaker box that would sit on your, uh, like, the, the desktop. 
and it would plug into a peripheral port, I believe. And uh, it would be able to produce more complex sounds than its traditional PC speaker, um, but it, it it was still just kind of a one-channel thing. So it was this. Uh, LGR has an episode on the sound source. No, actually, um, I can't remember if LGR does, but 8-Bit Guy does. So if you want to look up a bit about the Disney sound source, go check 8-Bit Guy's video. And uh, next up, we have a report on computer game software. And I was uh, pretty interested in the fact that, so, you know, computer software is going up and everything, but actually they're doing pretty good numbers before CD-ROM comes in. Like, CD-ROM is just very barely there. But it's not until 92 and 93 that we start seeing people just investing in PCs because of CD-ROM. And in, in, in part, maybe they were anticipating it coming down the line. But this was a, a, actually a, a, a very interesting thing to see. Uh, they're only reporting on the first three months of 1991. And by they, I mean the Software Publishers Association, who were the only people tracking this stuff in those days. They didn't track uh, console software, they only tracked computer software. And they have a whole book about uh, what computer software sold, uh, you know, at least, I think, 50,000 units and 100,000 units and uh, 250,000 units. Because nothing sold a million back then in computer software. Piracy and limited reach combined. On the ad page, we have Falcon 3.0 by Spectrum Holobyte for uh, the IBM computers. And actually, it, it even includes the PS2. Which, you know, for a flight sim, not really that uncommon, but it's just funny to see games for the PS2. Because uh, nobody really... Nobody really uh, bought uh, the IBM PS2. Which has nothing to do with the Sony PlayStation 2. It's a diversion computer platform that they set up um, with uh, OS 2. You can learn a bit about that if you want. You want uh, go to... Uh, the Digital Antiquarian, he has a whole thing about OS2 and PS2. The Falcon series uh, is kind of interesting. Uh, it was started by uh, one of the founders of Spectrum Holobyte uh, named Gilman Louie. And so he, you know, he was one of these crack programmers who came up with some uh, cool 3D uh, effects on early computers. And uh, he did a lot of games in the Falcon series, and they got really big in Japan, particularly. It's actually the... A very special game for the Ninte the uh, Sega SG-3000. There's a port of Falcon on there. And it will not work if you use a power-based converter on uh, the Master System. Because there's... Or actually, it wasn't a... Or on, on the Genesis. Um, actually, it wasn't a Master System? No, no. I think it was SG-1000. Uh, yeah, SG-1000 game. That you could play on the, on the Master System. But you can't play it... On the Genesis, this is the one incompatible game because it uses some special hardware just to get the 3D effect to work. Back into the news, Sim Ant is coming out. Yes, Sim Ant, which seems like a complete anticlimax uh, in terms of going from Sim City to Sim Earth. Um, you know, and and they have this thing. Uh, debunked rumors of Sim Universe because they can only kind of conceive of things going up and up and up. And Spore is not Sim Universe, so it's not like, oh, they predicted Spore. Spore is a very particular type of game. It, it promised to be a lot, uh, and it's not what it promised to be, but it's still a, uh, a really nice game that I, I think is very relaxing. And Sim Ant is very much in that style too. It, it's just, it's a fun, humorous game that uh, simulates things at a, uh, at a micro level, quite literally. So, Simant is pretty cool. Um, then, I could barely find out anything about this. Lightwaves Technology Game Sounds Remote Headphones for the NES. I have absolutely no idea how this sounded. I couldn't even find people doing a, you know, review on YouTube or anything. Uh, it probably sounded awful. Even if it, if the connection was okay. Uh, I just can't imagine why you would possibly want the sound of the NES just barging into your ears like that. I like me a chip tune, but not like that. 
And now we have another uh, bit of Spectrum Holobyte news, and they are working on Crisis in the Kremlin, which is a whole game about um, a uh, flight. Uh, yeah, it's when the uh, Soviet pilot defected to the other side of the Berlin Wall, and it was a big uh, national national crisis and everything. So I believe this is a flight sim of some kind would make sense for Spectrum Holobyte. Uh, of course, they're really going off of their uh, Tetris branding that they uh, that they did in the the U.S. and and the U.K. of uh, developing a game that out of these very strong Russian elements with the um, the the palace uh, and you know. Um, Russian style music and everything, which was later aped by Nintendo, but actually starts with Spectrum Holobyte. Uh, but something I thought was interesting is that even after the big rights fiasco with Tetris and everything, and uh, Mirrorsoft and Spectrum Holobyte combined coming off a bit worse than that, they were still publishing Tris games for the computer platforms. They were still allowed to do stuff like um, Word Tris and I'm not sure if Hat Tris. Uh, you know, well Tris and Faces Tris 3. Yeah. The, so they were, they were actually still on good enough terms that they kept releasing games in the general Tetris series. And now this story is uh, seems pretty minor, but it's actually a pretty big one. Acclaim has get, uh, gained the option, well, it's one of four companies, to get the option to develop uh, or to manufacture their own cartridges for the NES. So this is one step in Nintendo giving up its control on how they are handling the NES situation. They would control the amount of uh, product that went out by limiting the amount that was manufactured. But to their biggest partners, biggest in the sense of just like they supported them very, very strongly, uh, Acclaim, Activision, Sunsoft, and Konami. They have given them the right to uh, create their own plastic housing for the cartridges. I believe they still had to get all the chips and everything from Nintendo. But they were working with Keytronic, which is a keyboard manufacturer, to create uh, these uh, moldings for the cartridges. And uh, also interesting, I thought, was uh, that Acclaim had an office... Uh, for in both Britain and Germany. So they, they were one of the only company, you know, there was the Japanese companies who had stuff in America, but they were one of the few companies that were really taking a serious look at the European market. But they were marketing everything under LJN, so I'm not sure how successful that was. And this story is really weird to me. Uh, Gilligan's Island uh, Pinball Machine, which is just a line of licensed pinball machines, but it's not a very relevant property in 1991. There was no like reboot movie like The Addams Family or anything like that. Tell me if I'm wrong. I honest, I, I looked it up and, I, and the only thing that I could see is that they re-aired the, or they aired for the first time the original pilot of Gilligan's Island in 1992. So way out outside of this. So I have no idea why they decided to license Gilligan's Island. I want to look this next ad page before we get into the next story. It is one of the gold box games, Secret of the Silver Blades. The title reminds me a lot of Wheel of Time, as do the photos. Uh, you know, it's a lot on the mind recently. But yeah, the the gold box games were coming out in quick succession, and you could you, know, you could buy all of them for barely barely much of anything at this point. They were coming out way too quickly. I think that. Let's see. I don't know, like, they came out with, like, seven and five years or something like that. It was, it may, uh, maybe I'm wrong about that, but it, but it was at least, like, one a year, and it was, it was too much. I, it's basically the same game every time, just changing the story, which was great for a certain type of person, um, and they had a very good form of copy protection in the fact that you needed the manual and everything to even understand what was going on, so the value of the game really came out of the story. But it wasn't, not like these were complex stories or anything. So, uh, I know that CRPG Addict, um, if you go to his blog, he has uh, favorites among these, but really they, they're very much the same all the way through. Ah, uh, yes, and then this uh, is 
the first burst of multimedia software, the exotic showroom, which is just a disc with a bunch of cars on it. I mean, back before the internet, that's how you went and looked at cars, if you couldn't go and look at cars in real life. Uh, but pr a bit more interesting is uh, the Super Car Pack, which uh, combines a whole bunch of uh, programs, including games. And um, bundles like this were very common in the 90s. It's actually where you made most of the money because you sold into a bundle and then those sales were already done and then uh, whoever was bundling uh, the stuff would have to sell it themselves. So manufacturers love bundles because you could put it out in series like this. And next up we are talking about ad libs and actually getting a price reduction. Uh, legendarily expensive, though I don't think that they really hold the the top tier of sound cards even today. So I, I'm yeah, AdLib wasn't the the best of the best. Though there's like you know, like the AdLib Gold that's mentioned on here and everything were highly prized, but I don't think that they were always the best sounding for games. But still a solid option in a lot of cases. And next up, this is a... I have absolutely no idea what this story is. The, the Fuji Home Office Council has, has formed. And they made the Fuji Home Official Guide. And it's some multimedia thing that I don't get. I've looked at this story and I do not understand what this is, really. Except just like, you know... Something you could get a book in a book in floppy disk or CD-ROM form. I don't understand. It's not that important. Next up, Athana Floppy Cleaners. So this is one of these specialized cleaning things that you could use to uh, fix your your whatever. But yeah, in retrospect, with you know ha people having done so much with uh, repairing and fixing and cleaning all sorts of ancient devices. All you need is a Q-tip and a, uh, a, uh, a some, some rubbing al alcohol. It's all you need. It's really, it's really not that complicated to fix something like that. Also, I apologize if uh, anyone's been uh, talking in the chat, uh, because I don't know if my stream thing was, uh, working, but to, uh, to uh, reiterate, we are looking at computer games and oh, where are video games and computer entertainment for September of 1991. Cover picture of the Rocketeer. We haven't gotten there quite yet, but we are well on our way. So we're in, deep into the news stories that were out in September of 1991. Hopefully this isn't crashing. It might be crashing, everybody. Uh, this happens. Okay, no, we're good. Let's see. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction somehow. Uh, yeah, don't don't ever use the scroll wheel in this program. Uh, just use the arrow keys. We get a little clickiness. But anyways. Back on track. So, uh, the, the next story is uh, Electronic Arts has a game coming out called Hard Nova that I absolutely know nothing about, but they have a strategy guide that they are packaging with it uh, that's 104 pages. And uh, they call it a clue book, which is very similar to uh, the way uh, Infocom would do their uh, strategy guide stuff back in the day. And I don't know if it has any of the same sort of features where you can reveal stuff only if you really want to. But that is probably just a sign that the game is very obtuse and not not that great. But I don't know. I haven't played it. Then Curtis Manufacturing has the keyboard organizer. So this is something that straps on top of a standard key well no you slot in the standard keyboard and then you have all this stuff on the side of it very inconveniently placed and but at the same time 
especially this floppy disk stuff, actually that was pretty useful, especially if your keyboard was, you know, one of those all-in-ones like an Amiga or something like that. So you would be able to rapidly switch in the, um, the, the disks if you needed to do disk swapping. Uh, so having a place to store those and you could actively get to them was pretty uh, necessary. But like storing your mouse on your keyboard like this, it's just, it, it, it's barbaric. It's not civilized. Uh, and finally up, we have Sony unveils the laser library, which uh, is just a bunch of CD-ROM um, programs that Sony put together. And one of the ga games here is uh, Mixed Up Mother Goose by Sierra. And, uh, which was purportedly the first entertainment program to be on a CD run. I don't know if that's uh, true or anything like that, but that is the claim. It is very much in the same style as a Sierra Games, um, or the Sierra Online uh, adventure game. But it, 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 it's made for children. It's not very complex or anything like that. And before the next story, we will look at the ad page here. So we have a Raiden Triad and Warrior of Rome for the Genesis by Micronet. And down here you will see distributed by Big Net USA. And yes, that is actually the American subsidiary of Micronet. It's not Micronet USA. It's Big Net because Americans like it big, I guess. That just seems like a very, very poor, poor choice and everything. Good evening to you, Crater Gaming. Good to see you. So, uh, these were just, you know, they weren't a particularly special early uh, Genesis releases, but uh, Raiden Triad, of course, in the, the Raiden series, very well renowned by the shmup players. Uh, it's a parallax shmup, so it just kind of has stuff moving in the background and whatnot, but vertically scrolling uh, shmup, nothing too particularly important in that. And then um, Warrior of Rome was a turn-based strategy game, but uh, when it goes to this tactical screen, which, you know, may look similar to something like Advanced Wars, it actually plays more like the old computer game Ancient Art of War, which was kind of a proto real-time strategy game. So you would have uh, real-time engagements where you would be able to line up your troops in certain ways and uh, actively participate in the fight through one of the troops. So it's kind of interesting, but no, nowhere near a standout title on the Genesis or anything. Uh, and then this next story, we get to talk about VTech. Uh, and I didn't know how far back VTech actually went, but actually, uh, the first stuff that I had seen uh, with VTech in, in the record is they were making Pong consoles. So they were actually big on, on toy electronics even way back then. And on here, they're talking about some of their um, kid based computers, which is pretty much what they still do today, uh, though in a, le in a more abstracted scale. So they're very much like Leapfrog, if you don't know VTech, um, in the same sort of, uh, <laughs> nah, valve timing electronic controller. Not, yeah, if you're talking about this, no, that's not, not what that is. Um, but yeah, v VTech systems like the IQ Unlimited, um, yeah, they go back that far, which just surprises me. Then, uh, Time Out by Niche Technology, which is very similar to the Homework First system, which you may have seen on The Gaming Historian. And if you haven't seen it on The Gaming Historian, then uh, go watch that episode, because it's kind of interesting and, and fun, but it's also just not, <laughs> not a very practical solution to keep people from playing their NES all the time. Just take away the NES. Uh... <laughs> So they just show, sold you a brick of plastic that doesn't do nothing. And on this next story, we get early descriptions of civilization. And of course, at this time, Sid Meier was most known for Railroad Tycoon. Because that was the, the latest game to come out by him, and it was pretty successful. I'm not sure it was more successful than Pirates. But, uh, uh, Leapfrog was not started by Tom Kalinske. Uh, Tom Kalinske joined Leapfrog later. Uh, but he was a board member of Leapfrog. Um, 
At least as far as I know, that's true. I'm, I, I might be wrong. Maybe he was like a co-founder or something. I don't think he was the founder of Leapfrog. I feel like he would still be there if he was the founder of Leapfrog. Uh, but by the time, but uh, now he, he's not a Leapfrog anymore. But yeah, he did. He touched my childhood in a couple ways. He he helped in, uh, invent the Flintstones gummies, which I ate as a kid. Uh, and then he, you know, the console wars, Sega and stuff. I didn't have a Sega console or anything, but uh, he had an indirect influence that way. And then as a kid, I did play with Leapfrog. So, actually, Tom Kalinske is a bit of a, a, a man who has influenced my life. Very remotely. But, yeah, these uh, early descriptions of civilization, um, you know, it, it makes it sound very big and epic. And, of course, it is. It's a wonderful, wonderful game. But they don't actually show any screenshots of it. I don't know if they're like holding that back for a review. Uh, <laughs> I'm fully convinced Flintstones gummies are the only reason I survived to adulthood. <laughs> I, I I ate my vegetables and everything, but uh, you know sometimes you just need some some supplementary stuff. But down here they have some previews of different games that are not SimCity. Uh, that are also being published by Microprose. Uh, this one down here is Darklands, which was a very hyped up RPG that did not uh, amount to nearly as much as it was, but it's a very big cult classic. I have it on GOG. I haven't played it yet. And then uh, Hyperspeed, which is a, um, a 3D game of some sort. Uh, I forgot to look it up. So actually, I don't know what Hyperspeed is. And there's a couple other games uh, that Microprose is coming out with at the time. But uh, Civilization is the noted one, and it would be the one to stand the test of time. Ha ha ha. Interesting in here, they have reprints of the coin-op charts um, that are being published in Replay. Now, I uh, should say that these charts are not sales charts. They do not indicate what is the best-selling game or anything like that. Generally, in the coin-op industry, they don't think of things like that. What these are, are popularity charts. And what they'll do is they'll ask a limited number of operators to uh, send in what's the game doing best on your location um, or the game you're most pleased with. So there, there's very loose qualifications on everything. They don't have, they don't get the numbers. They don't get to check it like that. Um, well, sometimes they do. Sometimes they'll put an average of how much a game is earning on location at the time. And this is how they'll, they'll rate everything. And they have Upright Games, because Upright was not the only thing. They also had uh, Kit Games, which is not shown here. Um, well, I, gu I guess this is, yeah, Best Coin-Op Software. So it's Kit Games that are going into other games. So they can't call it an Upright. They're not selling a whole Upright. Um, but, yeah, Street Street Fighter... It's not Street Fighter. It's Street Fighter 2. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why the magazine hasn't caught on yet. Yeah, Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter was never, well, maybe it was a top game for like half half a day or something. It was, Street, you know, people were impressed by Street Fighter at the time because it had very big characters, but it's not a good game, as we discussed. And also, uh, Atari really, like, was hitting it in this time period, late 80s, early 90s, with their racing games. They're not very well remembered today, but they had these uh, various simulation racing games under the Driven brand. Race Driven, Hard Driven, um, and a couple other ones. And uh, even some that weren't on the, dri the Driven brand. But uh, yeah, Atari was really big in racing games, which not a lot of people think about. And then we have the top IBM PC games for April. So yeah, very, fu very far behind on this stuff, but... Uh, I, th I, I thought that a couple of things on here were interesting. First of all, Eye of the Beholder is on top. I believe that's a relatively new game uh, at that time. S and it's a take on the Dungeon Master formula, but kind of scaled down so that it would work on general PCs and not just the super PCs that it would w work on in 1987. Um, and four, there's four Sierra games, but two of them aren't even adventures. I mean, Red Baron was a very big thing, uh, I believe, developed by Dynamics for them. Uh, A10 Tank Killer, which I can't remember. I think that was a game that was also on the Sierra Network um, as well. But yeah, Sierra was more than just the adventure games. Uh, they put out a lot of different interesting software, but of, uh, 
on top is, of course, King's Quest and the Space Quest right behind it. Not a lot of people remember Space Quest today, um, and probably for good reason. Um, some other things. Sim Earth is beating Sim City. You think of Sim City as just a game that was just like on top of the charts forever, but Sim Earth actually got past it, uh, and it was even uh, past it in the month prior. Uh, and we have both Wing Commander, the original one, even as Wing Commander 2 is coming out, and its expansion disc were both on the chart at the same time. So that really shows you what, what a big thing Wing Commander was. This really was a big, um, a big, big thing in, uh, the, this, this period right here. Blows my mind that Sierra Network was ever a thing. And I believe the engineers would say the same thing to you because it was the most b bubblegum and uh, and masking tape solution to create an online server that has ever ever been done, and yet they kept it running for for many many years. And then we have down in the console charts they just called it video games because video games and computer entertainment those those things aren't video games. Um, Beat 'em ups are just kind of, you know, rocking the charts here. Um, I mean, the Simpsons one isn't a beat 'em up, but the uh, TMNT and Double Dragon Three uh, just really, really topping topping the charts on everything. Um, and uh, Genesis games are starting to climb the charts, uh, but thanks to a single company, Electronic Arts. Uh, Sega, as you can see, there's no Sonic on here. Sonic came out in like. July or was it August so maybe it wouldn't have had time to get to the charts but Genesis was being supported and brought up almost entirely by EA with John Madden and uh, NBA basketball I mean both these went down in the charts uh, compared to the other games uh, in the list well no, I, I was looking at the wrong thing uh, so yeah Lakers versus Celtics so they had that basketball game LGN had a different basketball game I don't know why you'd ever want to play a basketball game on your Game Boy, but it was the time. Game Boy was a hot thing. People always forget how important Game Boy was to Nintendo's continued dom dominance. Um, but yeah, LTN and Acclaim just, like, uh, it, it hurts to see, but they're there. They, you, you can't deny them, especially the Simpsons game. Oh, my God. And, of course, you have these kind of Nintendo stuff, but, I, you know, in general, Super Mario Land is still the only game actually worth owning for the Game Boy. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, it, it, it's not it's not the 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 greatest lineup in uh, in in history or anything. The, the computer game one is definitely looking a bit better. I would have some some interesting duds on there. Oh yeah, also uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. That was kind. But they're not. They don't call it Microsoft Flight Simulator. They just call it Flight Simulator. And on this next page, we see that um, video games, computer entertainment, had their own tip line you could call into, uh, which I imagine must have been hell for the people who, who were doing the tip line. Like at least at Nintendo, you know what people are gonna call in for, and you have all these game stuff for games and everything. But like. This kind of thing, you don't know what they're going to call in for. These guys are covering arcade, console, and home computer games. And, like, how how is everybody supposed to know? And a dollar forty-nine a minute, which I'm not even sure, um, you know, how that compares to the Nintendo hotline. But, yeah, be best just submit your question and hope they answer it. Uh, now we have Brain Bender for the Game Boy, a very 90s-style advertisement here. Uh, it's a laser, uh, like you use mirrors to bounce lasers around a thing to like pop balloons and all that stuff. Very similar to a lot of stuff, uh, like from incredible machine style games. But the, the one thing about it is that it's very choppy. It, it's actually slow for a puzzle game. Things don't instantly react when you turn the mirrors and, you know, fix the lasers onto, uh, everything. So actually not, not one of the great Game Boy puzzlers. By Electro Brain, whoever the heck they are, I honestly don't know. Ah, uh, yes, this is one of the these famed Funko Land product listings, which has caused so much 
discussion over whether or not some of the games in here that never came out were actual games. Um, yeah, there's a lot of debate uh, on this stuff. Of course, the famous y yeah, yeah, Beavis one, but it's not on here. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through all of these to try and uh, validate any of this stuff, but uh, people can get continue to debate about it. I will, I will keep out. If I don't see something, uh, you know, in, in a screenshot or anything, I don't think... It's hard to tell if it existed, really. And now we have uh, another Secret Tips page. Uh, it's, it's Easter Egg Hunt. But it's not really an Easter egg. It's, a, it's just kind of... You know, it's, it's just extra lives codes and things like that. But, I mean, I guess it's an Easter egg by the technical definition. Kate, I need a ruling on this. You haven't seen Kate's video on the first Easter egg. Uh, go, go check out Kate Willard, a critical hit on YouTube. But, uh, yeah, th th I mean, this stuff used to be accidental. I'm sure everybody knows the story behind uh, Gradius on the NES, where he just forgot to take out the code, and then people found it. And I have to imagine that happened kind of independently several different times. I don't know the full history of game codes. Um, I I'm, I'm sure that they were more common in computer games as well. So I don't know the full history of that, but, uh, you know, they, this was, this started to become something that they purposely did. You know, they made these codes that they could sell to uh, strategy guides or uh, hotlines or magazines and stuff like that. And, but generally, if, if they were discovered out in the wild, the magazines wouldn't know about it. It often would be readers sending them in. Like, a lot of this stuff, like it says, Jason Wing of Orange County, California, sent in a way to restore, restore all your life in, uh, what is this game, Techno Cop, by Razorsoft for the Genesis. I have absolutely no clue. But, uh, yeah, they were, sometimes they weren't being publicized, and people just trial and errored and figured it out. I mean, supposedly, maybe these were all just fake letters from the, the publishers putting in tips on everything, but... I think that the um, that the tip stuff uh, is definitely ripe for someone to write about, just not me, because I'm not as much of a cultural person. Next up, we have The Punisher for the Game Boy. It's one of those fake light gun games where you drag a cursor around and shoot at, shoot at things and uh, try not to shoot the, the civilians and whatnot. Not that The Punisher would really care about that. It is classic LJN trash. Yes, it's put out under acclaim, but it is LJN trash, and you know what I mean. More tip page. Um, there's another catalog, and I just thought that this catalog was interesting because they're really putting forward Genesis in this one. And like, you know, I, I said that there weren't many impressive games for the Genesis at the time, and I, I stand by that, but there were some interesting games for it, like, you know, being able to play Might and Magic on a console, that's pretty cool. Streets of Rage was out, you can't, you can't knock Streets of Rage. And the Spider-Man game, which we'll be talking about a bit later. Fantasy Star 3, Shining in the Darkness, which I think is Shining Force, uh, the original one, or, or maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, and uh, NFL Hockey, was it NFL Hockey, or was it just Hockey? Yeah, and a, and a, NHL hockey, not, not NFL. NFL is going on now. <laughs> it is the season for the, 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 the football. And another one of these pages, you know, I'm not going to go through the, the, the different codes and everything. Uh, so we saw Bard's Tale, the construction set earlier, and now we have Bard's Tale on the NES. And it's a pretty faithful uh, translation on everything. FCI tended to do that. They really saw a lot of value in RPGs, not just kid stuff. So they were trying to find an adult market on the Famicom and NES. But it's like it's really, really difficult to make a translation like this good when you have those passwords. You have to put on these passwords. Uh, because they weren't willing to shell out for a save function on everything. And that just really drags down the experience of whether or not you want to get back to that, or you'd rather jump into something like Contra and be able to play right away. I think it's really cool, a lot of the, uh, the um, RPGs on the NES, and being able to play 
uh, all these different uh, games of that sort. But uh, it really, it, it re they generally weren't great uh, translations. Now I have a two-page ad on the Turbo Graphics CD. Oh yes, um, and it's it's just a really bad ad, in my opinion. Like, it's just. Uh, the, the colors that they use for their advertising, they really wanted to stick with this white background and yellow uh, frontal stuff. Like, look at look at the texture on this. What does this actually say? I mean, it reminds me of the Mortal Kombat stuff. Uh, you know, that... I don't know if that was the movie or like Mortal Kombat 2 or something. So it reminds me of that font. But not... But it's, it's, it's hard to read, even. It, and it just looks ugly. And generally, I don't think they're putting their best foot forward with all this FMV stuff. Uh, they just aren't able to capture the same sort of excitement that video game companies will later with stuff. Like, why are you showing this? I, this is a screenshot from It Came From The Desert. You're showing... Yeah, you'd look silly too. So you're showing this lady with a goofy look on her face. And not the giant ants. Not the gameplay of shooting these big ants. I don't know what they were going for with this stuff. And, you know, they were just they were just too early to catch the multimedia thing. They started to stoke the excitement about it, but by the time they were into this, they got out of the market. Uh, and uh, the Turbo Graphic CD really had no chance. Next page. All right, now we have some reviews. I'm not gonna go through all the reviews and everything and point out how uh, this this editor says this one time and yeah, all that stuff. Not not my interest and in, you know the scores and everything. Don't care much about that. But let's just talk about the game. So Bo Jackson baseball on NES. You know the second appearance of Bo Jackson on an NES game. Uh, if you recall, he was in Tech Mobile. Making a very strong appearance in Tech Mobile. He did move from football to being a baseball player, and he was actually a pretty good baseball player, from what I know. Uh, it's not really a special sort of game, though it takes off of kind of the Cinematronics World Series style of, uh, you know, pitch, pitching, well, not, not pitching, you know, you can do outfield stuff too. So you have a big, strong characters, and then when you hit the ball, it changes to the outfield and all that stuff. So. Uh, actually, it was a Beam Software game. I didn't, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, but they took a lot of cues off of like Family Stadium and those sorts of games. It's not a particularly special baseball game. Now I have the Illuminator, the Game Boy Light accessory, licensed by Nintendo. Um, yeah, this is even more impractical than the official one. I had an official one for the Game Boy Color, one of those uh, light screens and everything, and I, I, I have a. Uh, somewhat embarrassing memory of in the middle of a big rainstorm during the summer camp I was in, inside the building very desperately trying to find a save spot uh, to close out my uh, Pokemon uh, probably silver game at that time um, maybe it was red I had red and silver and then later uh, ruby oh yeah I had platinum too but I'm pretty sure it wasn't platinum but uh, I had a I had the official uh, dong dongle for the uh, light thing, and I was cr crying over the fact of whether or not I would be able to, to save. And then <laughs> it was, yeah, it, it, it was one of those 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 kid moments. But yeah, Illuminator, avoid. Now we have Mini Putt for the NES, oh. uh, which I did not even look up. So I have absolutely not a clue about how good of a golf game that is this is i do kind of like um golf uh video games they tend to have some some interesting twist to them uh and now we have fantasia for the genesis which uh was after uh castle of illusion uh very famously this game was recalled uh, you can read more about the, the full story of the development and everything in uh, Ken Horowitz's book, Playing at the Next Level. But uh, this game was recalled because uh, they uh, supposedly, 
Sega had been given the license in error. Uh, that they there was some sort of edict that uh, Fantasia was never to be uh, like changed or adapted in any sort of way by Walt Disney himself. He said, you know, don't don't spoil this creation. So they had worked on this game and uh, Disney financed them to recall it all. And they. Uh, they, they did so, and, and whether or not that's true, given that you have Fantasia 2000, and uh, later uh, there's like a rhythm game based on Fantasia and everything, you know, whether they just abandoned that or not, I have absolutely no idea if that's a, if that, that request by D Walt Disney was true. People say some things that Walt Disney said that he, he, he didn't say. Uh, that's just a, a fact of the matter, but yeah, it was a Sega of America development. Uh, it was their first big development, and they had to pull it off shelves. Uh, they didn't lose any money from it, but it was, you know, they didn't get anything from it. So it was not really a great, a great trade-off. And now we uh, get to Bill and Ted for the NES, which we saw a ad for earlier. Uh, and like I said, it's a, uh, a very CRPG-esque game and has some weird humor to and everything and speaking of weird humor across these bottom pages we have toe jam and earl sneaking on so it's a cool like it's an interesting exploration game but it's it, it's not that fun really it's it, it's just kind of kind of boring and difficult you just gotta get jump into things and find people um and i believe it, it even has a timer and everything that's that's always annoying And, and then we have Yo Bro for the TurboGrafx-16. Now, the TurboGrafx gets its re a reputation for having very bad games, especially when they try to, to imitate uh, different sorts of games. And uh, this is one of those where it definitely earns it. It's like a sloppy version of Fester's Quest for the NES. Um, it is really... Just a weird run around a city, shoot things, but it's kind of kid friendly sort of game. And there was this very in there was this kind of style that a lot of the games that NEC published had, and it's just like so unappealing. Like even in like um, Darkwing Duck, uh, it has this very garish graphical style. They really like the pinks. They really want to emphasize pink all the time, and it. Just, I, I hate how it looks. Doesn't look like it plays very well. Um, yeah, D Yo Bro is is not is not the classic you're looking for on the Turbo Graphics 16. And the final part of the the Toe Jam and Earl ad, you know, it spreads across these four pages. And then there's Smash TV for the NES. Uh, which has a one notable feature of you can use two joyce two um, uh, controllers to have a dual joystick control basically, and you can also do it with multi tap. So if you have an ability to put in uh, four controllers to the NES, you can have it register for one. Uh, you can for two controllers for one player and uh, two controllers for the other player. So that's pretty neat. Uh, it's it's an okay port. It's not not anything to write home about though it does have this so they have this screen in the the nes game uh from from the original which of course is just a takeoff on robo uh cop and you know that seems like it would be a lapse in nintendo's usual control but this was a claim that was doing this port so they were probably given a bit of a uh, free free hand to do some stuff that other publishers wouldn't be allowed to do um you know, I'm not always sure that Nintendo was entirely fair in terms of its content restriction. I mean, there's, there's some lapses. Um, not Corpse Party, because that didn't come out in the U.S. But there are some games that uh, definitely were not following by every rule uh, that Nintendo set out. If those rules that are even published online are even real, which I don't know. I've just, I've just questioned that. Then we have another... Uh, mail order ad and then we have worm for the nes uh the so it's a strange game that's a, a combo of the side scroller 
with this uh, female character that really reminds me of Super Cobra after I've seen uh, Kate's video on Metroid. Go look up uh, Critical Hit on uh, YouTube to see some interesting uh, stuff about the or the uh, artistic inspirations of Metroid. So, you, you, it has a side-scrolling section, then it has, uh, you know, one of those fake light gun uh, forward shooting sections. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just a very strange sort of game. Uh, <laughs> With a, a, a interestingly weird sci-fi setting. Would not recommend. Adventure Island 2. This is where the series comes into its own after, uh, you know, it being just a reskin of Wonder Boy. So they had a lot of options to do different sorts of things uh, with the game. And so, like, Hudson Soft was, like, so prolific. They were making most of the games for the Turbo Graphic. They were one of the biggest uh, publishers of... Uh, computer games in Japan and they were doing all this stuff for Nintendo all the time they had so much going on but as prolific as they were they were never really successful which is so weird uh, they never had a runaway hit like Adventure Island and Bonk they're fine but they they were never at the level of some of the bigger publishers and whatnot and probably because because they spread their focus too thin and, uh, you know, they didn't, they never really found a big foothold in the U.S., though they did found this, uh, Hudson Soft USA. I would like to hear, uh, those guys' perspectives on trying to sell these weird, uh, games. But I think, like, like, Hudson Soft was a very minimal level of weird. Enjoy Hudson! But, yeah, they're just a, a fascinating company I would really love to know a lot, whole lot more about. Then we have American Gladiators for the NES. This is uh, one of the games published by a favorite of the of Gaming Alexandria. That is Chris Oberth. Uh, uh, Dev tragically no longer with us, but uh, we have uh, preserved some of his discs in uh, partnership with the VGHF. So Chris Oberth uh, worked on this game as well as uh, Stan Fukuoka doing the doing the artwork and it was published by game tech game tech is just this bizarre publisher that is just the most minor publisher it's a uk based one that that ever thought it was big it like really wanted to show to everyone i'm a big publisher i'm a big boy in the pool but they were just never able to uh find their footing as a publisher uh you know no no offense to the brits there are plenty of other good companies out there but Game Tech is not one of them. And then we also have Spider-Man for the Genesis. Uh, it's a it's an interesting game. Uh, it has some cool stuff like the the photography mechanic, um, and, but it, it's it's just generally flawed. Uh, the controls make it very difficult to do stuff like web swinging, which should be super easy. You know that's kind of the the one rule everybody learned from Spider-Man Two: web swinging should be easy but still have some kind of curve and challenge to it. Um, you know, it looks, it looks pretty good and has kind of cool comic book aesthetics uh, to it, but generally it's just, kinda, it's just a very flawed game um, and the timer doesn't help. Yeah, like the web limit and there's certain parts where you need the web to get over stuff, so it doesn't give a lot of room for exploration. It's caught in this weird mix between uh, the arcadey stuff and the and the console stuff and that's about halfway through so we are going to be taking a break and I will be back and we will continue our read through of video games and computer entertainer September 1991 see you in a bit
All right, we return back to our reading of Video Games and Computer Entertainment for September of 1991. We're about halfway through, especially because this next page, I'm not going to say a whole lot about it. So we have a guide for Deja Vu, one of the most confusing games on the NES. But I mean, look at this artwork. Look at that. This is not this is not for a gaming magazine. No. This is for a true noir thriller. Ah, oh, this is this is some lovely stuff for a game that is totally not worth it. Not in its original incarnation and definitely not for its NES incarnation. Deja Vu is one of those most enigmatic games. It's like why did you port this to the NES? <laughs> Why is it there? I do like how the the filter on this and everything makes it look almost almost okay, but it's it's not good. Especially when you see it up close. I thought this was hair, like a judge's wig. But no, this is his head and these are stairs behind him. Impressive for the NES, but uh, <laughs> crocodile. <laughs> Look at those eyes. Meh. Yeah. They put way too much effort into this. Nobody needed this for Deja Vu. You really didn't need to see the end. The end. That's it. It's all you get. Alright, now we're into the cover st story. Uh, the Rocketeer. For multiple different systems, the uh, Super NES version is up first, and then the NES version, and then the uh, home computer versions, which are more or less identical to the uh, uh, Super Nintendo version. But, um, yeah, they're very different games. You know, as you might expect on the NES, it's a traditional si side-scroller shoot uh, Nazis. Is, I know there's Nazis in the, in the film, but... I, I presume you're punching Nazis in the face, so if you're into that kind of thing, you can you can try this game. But the uh, SNES and computer versions are completely different. It's a mix between um, a flight racing game and a flight in a shmup sh uh, shooting game, and just kind of gallery shooting sections where it's kind of like. Uh, I can't remember that Star Wars game uh, from later. I know there's there has to be a game that predates this in terms of you have a character on the screen is actually moving between cover to shoot at people. So you have your reticle on screen and your guy will walk back and forth. Whatever whatever style of shooter that is, it's it's very awkward because the game moves really fast. It is an extremely fast game, very zippy. Things just keep happening constantly so it is not one of those uh movie licensed game which really lives up to its uh, lofty expectations not that i'm sure how lofty your expectations can be from seeing the rocketeer again i haven't seen it i don't know if it's really as good as people say normally when people say that uh it's not but i'll i'll reserve judgment on that front And now we have the Koei games. Ah, yes, Koei. Lampere and uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2. Koei is just a studio that knew what they were, and they never de deviated from what they were doing. And somehow, even in the NES market, they managed to find success. You know, way before Dynasty Warriors came into the picture, and became uh, Koei Tecmo later and all that stuff, Koei just knew what they were doing. And they just, like, we're not going to do anything outside of that. They made these giant turn-based strategy games. And on the NES, and they even, like, had to put extra chips in it and everything. They, they managed to find some success somehow. They managed to find a market. Uh, yeah, the Koei games are not that uncommon in terms of collecting or anything. And now we have this review for the Gilligan's Island pinball, but it, you know, said what I had to say on that. I haven't played this one, so I can't uh, really explain. Um, and then we have Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. 
for the NES uh, published by Virgin Games. So, you know, I said Bill and Ted was very much a computer game pretending to be a console game. Robin Hood Prince of Thieves is perhaps the most computer game pretending to be a console game because it tries to have action elements, but it's just awkward as hell. It's, it's very much like Times of Lore. Which, you know, tried to add some action stuff into a traditional RPG. And, yeah, this, is, this isn't really... I mean, it, it has stats and stuff, but I wouldn't really call it an RPG. Um, it's, yeah, it's very expensive. It is definitely something that will, that will give, you, give you a little stuff for your money. But it is not suited to be a console game. It is really not fun as an action game. So, again, it's, a, it's an interesting exploratory game. Virgin often put out some interesting software. I think they're a little bit overlooked. That people, uh, that they got a bad reputation based on a, on a couple things. Not that I'm saying Robin Hood for the NES is particularly great. But I think it's kind of, it's, it's worth a look. And now we have Road Riot Forward by Atari in the arcade. So this game is like totally obscure. Like, I'm not sure how many people ever would have played this. But it's, you know, a... Um, it's a racing game that has kind of, uh, Mario Kart competitive elements. You know, Mario Kart wasn't out yet, so it was just one of these competitive racing games where you could kind of ram people off the road, road rash style and all that. The thing to me is it barely looks like an arcade game, even if you were looking at the, uh, direct arcade screenshots. Uh, it, it was this kind of early semi-digitized graphics, you know, in the style of Donkey Kong Country, uh, and and things like that so the, it, it's a very um fully realized roadster that can like uh, you know be in eight um eight directions or something like that but it's it just looks really really cheap in a lot of ways like i said atari was really on top of the world with racing games before namco and sega kind of cleaned their clocks on everything but this was not one of their their most stellar racing games they did, they did much better when they were sticking to a full 3D sort of perspective and those characters. Ugh. Prince of Persia on Game Boy. Uh, it was published by Virgin Games uh, because Broderbund had gotten out of the console industry after the U-Force. And if you want to learn more about that, you can uh, check out the uh, U-Force video that uh, Norm, the gaming historian, did. And I believe they sold all those assets to THQ, which is what allowed THQ to begin um, getting into the console space. And, uh, yeah, this is actually not a bad port. It actually runs really well. Um, you know, the, the original Apple II game runs really badly because it was really stretching the limits of the Apple II. But they thought, because they were working in a much lower resolution, uh, they, and they didn't have to, like, every single pixel between every step. Yeah, it, it's less of a cinematic platformer. It's more of a traditional platformer. But it, it's not not at all bad. Not a bad way to experience Prince of Persia. And now we have player poll demographics. And, um, you know, a whole lot of uh, interesting detail in here. But a couple things that I thought were particularly interesting. First of all, TurboGrafx is on the rise. Uh, in this this period, so the, from 19% to almost 30% of uh, respondents in here. Now, a lot of these respondents, this was definitely a wealthy set of people because a lot of these respondents had to have overlapped, and especially uh, Neo Geo, 3.9% penetration. Uh, I I think that those were, I think the majority of those entrants were just people who wished they had. Neo Geo, because <laughs> yeah, the the uh, AVS a AES. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, there's no real numbers on how a lot of this stuff sold, but yeah, uh, even in this rich set of people who read uh, video games and computer entertainment, I'm still skeptical that they got four percent of people to have a Neo Geo. That would have been a worth catering to at that point. Four percent. I mean, the these entrants were probably not more than a hundred people. Let's kind of see this, uh, you know, a couple hundred people. We'll see on the next page. But still, four percent is way higher than I think. Um, uh, 
Yeah, and then... Is that on the next page? Oh yeah, so, um, in terms of early Genesis games, Fantasy Star 2 was like the top early Genesis game. Um, and you can see this in a lot of other magazines and ads and stuff like that. But yeah, people really love Fantasy Star 2. It was probably one of the most successful conversion things of people playing a JRPG and then getting interested in RPGs in general. And that is not really surprising when you think of Final Fantasy VII later on. And it really seems like the style is what drew them in. And Fantasy Star 2, and just, you know, the Fantasy Star series in general, has really good style. And then you can, you know, look at the uh, other things up here. Nothing that is too surprising. I guess, you know, maybe Final Fantasy actually sold something. <laughs> it's a little bit surprising. Uh, Bonk's Adventure, you know, we have this big Turbo Graphics uh, demographic, so yeah, Bonk's Adventure on top. But. Oh. Yeah, they. Uh, it it kind of becomes clear when you're looking in here, especially the prior page, uh, where, you know, the, the top vote got 30. So, not, not a whole lot of people were actually responding to these polls. Uh, so I wouldn't wager more than 400, and that's probably going high. Probably not more than 300. So they're trying to make all the all this claims and stuff, but it's just it's just not. They don't they don't have the numbers to really uh, survey a demographic, you know. Unless you have something as a reward for people turning that stuff in, they're just not going to turn it in. So you're really not going to reach all of your reader base uh, with a demographic survey. Zombie Nation. One of the weirdest games ever created. And, you know, this one, this, you know, it, it makes it seem a little less weird when you see the ad and you see, like, what this guy's face is supposed to be. And then you can kind of get it. But since he's all red in the game, it just makes it look like a raging zombie head shooting God knows what. Very, very strange game. So this is a, a theme-based article uh, written by Joyce Wardley, <clears throat> and this was very uh, common what they did in the electronic games days. They would just kind of like take a bunch of games that had a similar theme and then talk about them all together. Uh, and that, that kind of made sense back in the day when there were so few themes to the games and there were so few games coming out that it was possible to talk about these things without d diverging too far and people were looking for more aesthetic differences but really it's it's an outdated concept by this point it, people aren't really looking at games in this way it's like what are the games that i can play to recreate the gulf war um and maybe that would have been more present in computer gaming but it is like just really it's really not an, an, an interesting column or anything like that so yeah it, it's very much out of its place in time and it's something that is more more present in electronic games and i'm pretty sure after a while they must have stopped doing this because they got more stuff to cover this is, this is kind of filler stuff i don't need to cover kageki fists of steel for the genesis it's a pit fighter style brawler and the guys all have really big hits <laughs> yeah, big heads, no code necessary. And then you have all the, these other games that I have absolutely no idea anything about. In Sector X, Shadow Blasters, and Crackdown. I all for the Genesis. Yeah. Sage's Creation have not a clue. Don't ask me about it. And then you have PGA Tour Golf for the Genesis. So another one of these electronic arts creations. Um... They really try to make this look cool and fun. Uh, it, it was a port of their computer game that they had put out. Uh, the first in, in their series, which is kind of still going on today, I think. But it's now Tiger Woods Golf or something else. 
but uh, it's one of the, the the first game to introduce kind of the three click method of like your meter and your 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 yeah like three meters that you do before before you do the shot your curve and um, all that stuff I can't remember the specific it's not the first golf game with a meter uh, there were earlier games that had kind of a, a you know a power meter like a Data East had one. But, yeah, PGA Tour Golf. Just another part of EA's dominance on the Genesis. Now, this is a more interesting theme article. So, this talks about the rising movement in kids' software, which can charitably call, be called games sometimes. You know, there are kids' games, but then they're just kind of software uh, that just kind of, you know, trying to teach concepts and whatnot. And it has an ending, but it's not really a game. Uh, you know, just. So, like, Mixed Up Mother Goose. So, stuff from uh, Sierra and Broder Bund and also Game Tech as well. Yeah, Game Tech did a Candyland game. Um, which, you know, is more just a game for kids rather than kids software. But what I found interesting is that this article does not at all mention two of the biggest players in this particular market, which are The Learning Company and Davidson & Associates. Uh, Davidson and Associates had Math Blaster, and Learning Company had all sorts of stuff like Reading Rabbit, which was uh, apparently a favorite of me as a kid, but I cannot remember it at all now. But yeah, so th this is more interesting of a themed article talking about uh, the trends in kids' software, but it's really nothing uh, particularly special. And now Arcus Odyssey, promoted by professional gamer David Ezatz. Ezat. Yeah. David Ezat. From, who was going to San Jose State at the time. I, yeah, I don't know anything about David Ezat, so I don't know if he was just like a big shot in another game or something. This game is like an isometric gauntlet. It has spawners and everything. It doesn't have a timer or wizard needs food badly. But it, yeah, it's kind of a predecessor to Diablo in some ways. Like, looking at this screen up here, like, reminds me of Diablo quite a bit. Especially the second and third acts of Diablo 2, in particular. Um, but it, you know, it's just kind of a, a run through uh, and shoot things with your drone weapons kind of game. It's, it's Gauntlet, uh, just not as tight. Uh, because Gauntlet needs to be tight for the type of gameplay that it is. Renovation Products. Is that the same one that they did that, uh, that recreation that, that Frank suggested? I can't remember. Um, yeah, there's an ad that was recreated recently. Um. California Games 2 for PC. Now, the game series is just a notorious cluster of bad decisions on top of get bad gameplay. It's just like, the, it's the most precise button mashing and memorization stuff you will ever see. Extremely popular at the time, but it was just not made for, for good gameplay at all. Uh, maybe it's gotten better by California Games too, but I doubt it. Um, yeah, all the games series from Epics are just garbage. I am not a fan. And now the uh, the official Nintendo Light Boy, uh, which was a magnifying glass with a, a light to compensate for you know the terrible uh, backlight and everything. Uh, this ad is particularly funny because you, like using this thing. Uh, with the magnifying glass, you can't view it in multiple angles. So nobody else would be able to see what's going on on this thing. This is definitely false advertisement here. And uh, James Bond Stealth Affair on the Amiga. Uh, now this game is kind of uh, interesting. It was actually not originally a James Bond game. It only became a James Bond game when they imported it to the US. In the UK, it was called Operation Stealth. And it's kind of a Sierra-style adventure game in the in the vein of Monkey Island and uh, Fate of Atlantis. Maybe a bit more Fate of Atlantis. 
LucasArts style adventure game, I should say. I uh, get, getting mixed up here. So it's very it's it's very scum like, but uh, from everything that I've seen, it's really not particularly special. You know, it has some clunkiness with the interface and all that stuff. It doesn't have the the nice smooth uh, stuff that Scum introduced. But uh, yeah, I, I thought that maybe oh maybe this is like the first James Bond game, but no, not even close. Uh, James Bond games go all the way back. Uh, shaken, not stirred for the Atari 2600. I can't remember if that was a Frogo game or not. Uh, but yeah, James Bond games have been around forever. Eliminator Boat Duel! Ah uh, yes, yeah, so rad. This is the most 80s cover to ever come out of the 90s. Uh, it's a very competitive uh, boat racing game. Uh, it has both... Uh, Behind the boat racing and top down boat racing. Yeah, Electro Brain. They really like these garish ads. Which I mean, I guess I guess people get to look. I mean, this is the box cover for Eliminator Boat Duel. So it's kind of a micro machine style, like up up above racing game, but otherwise not hugely special. Pick and Pile, which is a computer game. By Ubisoft. Yes, Ubisoft was starting to break in uh, to other markets in the early 90s. Like, Ubisoft, in a lot of people's minds, just kind of comes out of nowhere. You know, whether they first remember them with Rayman, or they didn't even know them until, like, um, Splinter Cell, or something like that. But, yeah, Ubisoft had been out there, and they were creating these uh, different games, like these, this puzzle game, Pick and Pile, which is kind of an interesting point and click puzzler you know things kind of fall down and then you kind of arrange them into into place and you can't go beyond boundaries and whatnot uh like if i had this on a computer back in the day i probably would have played it but uh i'm not sure i have the patience for these uh puzzlers now maybe it would be pretty good for mobile phones they should think about re-releasing pick and pile wing commander 2 so wing commander 1 had a very stunning advertisement and wing commander 2 uh, was trying to take off of that, you know, showing you in-game graphics and everything. But the big difference in Wing Commander 2 is that instead of just, like, a very high-quality pixel art, um, they were actually using 3D modeling software that they developed in-house and then making uh, rendered versions of that. Uh, so that so that led a, lent a very different uh, style to the, to the graphics. And it, I mean, it's pretty much the same as the first game, but if that's what you're into, especially the the cinematic storytelling and dynamic intelligence, uh, that sort of stuff, which, uh, you know, is more subtly integrated into games now, were big features back in the day. Arachnophobia by Disney Software for the Amiga, Commodore 64, and IBM PC. So this game is... You tout it as all ages, but it's very gruesome. You, you go around and you kill bugs with a flamethrower, basically. Um, you know, people who don't like spiders, uh, maybe th this is definitely a game maybe that can help you get over that fear, but just, like, indiscriminately killing uh, parts of the ecosystem, I'm not sure I would consider that fully family-friendly, but back then, as long as there wasn't any blood, it was family-friendly. Not very good graphics. Uh, for for uh, its time. You know, it's a Mickey game. Uh, this is an interesting page from Sunsoft. So, of course, all of their uh, interesting hits of the time. Journey of Basilius, Batman, Spy Hunter, Euphoria, Gremlins 2. But uh, they, as a way to get them on your newsletter, they would put these high score things right beside them and ask you to send it in. Clip it out and send it in. Uh, and I thought, I thought this was a pretty clever way of enticing people into, um, you know, uh, signing up for the newsletter, show you how good I am. So I thought this was a pretty clever approach, a good, a good advertising approach, even though, you know, high score chasing was so much less of a thing, uh, then there were still in, in like the early nineties, there were still a sense that having a high score in a Game Boy game counted for something. All right, this game, Oils Well by Sierra for the PC. It is so weird. It's like an arcade-style puzzler. You have this pipe that you're guiding through 
these systems. But you don't guide the pipe. You put a cursor where you want the pipe to go, and then the pipe will follow, like, the most expedient route, uh, de uh, determining on where it is. And then there's these bugs you have to, like, attack as you go through this, and you have to collect all the dots, like in Pac-Man, and they, they kind of, they try to put, like, an educational thing behind it by, like, uh, making it so, like, the dinosaurs being dug up from the ground and everything, but, yeah, it's really just a bizarre puzzle game that <laughs> I'm not sure why it was ever made. Um, and next we have Death Knights of Kryn, another gold box game. So they're advertising one gold box game and they're still selling the old one. So, uh, yeah, and it, it's pretty much the same as all the others. You know, some interesting D&D uh, lore for people who are interested in that. Forgotten Realms, I believe. Um, or, yeah, it's not Eberron. Um, so I believe it, like all those, all those gold box games were Forgotten Realms. Um, but what, what interesting thing. So it's an SSI-developed game, but Electronic Arts was serving as the affiliate label distributor on this game. Uh, so SSI was a publisher, but uh, they had trouble getting stuff on store shelves. So EA would go to lesser publishers and take the rights to put the game on um, on store shelves. So, but but like SSI would have to put together the packaging and all the development stuff and everything. So EA was effectively serving as a distributor. But they're saying to call EA to if you have any. A question because that's how you acquire it you can't go to SSI and acquire it because EA has the distribution rights uh, Joel Billings of SSI and Trip Hawkins of EA were very close friends and Trip Hawkins was a very early investor in SSI Trump's Castle 2 the IBM PC uh, yeah this is a bit uh, an attempt at doing multimedia with very poorly uh, digitized photos and whatnot so Nothing much to talk about. It's a casino game. Moving on. Now, uh, I, I, you know, I skipped over some of the other mail-in services and whatnot, but I thought this one was particularly interesting. Uh, this is Psy, a video game service, and they specifically um, work in imports. So they, uh, you know, I mean, the prices on this are ridiculous because... <laughs> They had, to, they had to ship it over and everything, so I get it. But they're still pretty ridiculous. But if you were interested in import games, there were places you could go for this stuff. You didn't have to just go into back alleys and whatnot. So this is a mail order import uh, distribution thing to get stuff from Japan. So if you were interested in uh, what was coming out there, um, I'm not sure they would tell you all the things that you need. I mean, like, you know, they have the cartridge converter on here and everything, but... Uh, how did I, for, the, for the SNES, I just put, like, two little tabs in there. Uh, so you could just ply those out and play Japanese uh, Super Nintendo games. Um, but, yeah, the, these, these places did exist. Uh, so you could get a lot of uh, assistance on your import stuff. Uh, you can ask Chris Kohler a bit about that. I'm not sure that he went through this service in particular. Uh, so yeah, service card, you know, subscribe and all this stuff. Subscribe to the Gaming Alexandria, whatever we put this up on. The, the, the Twitch, the, the Twitters, the, the YouTube. You know, it, it, subscribe to it all. Anyways. Space Quest 4, Roger Wilco and the Time Rippers. Uh, the, yeah, this later style of Fiera, classic Fiera adventure game with the attempts at realistic models, to me, just looks hideous. I hate the way that people look in these games. They look stiff and they don't look real realistic really at all. They look like blow-up dolls. <laughs> and it's... Yeah, I, I find it so detestable in so many ways. I hate the style that they went down for um, Space Quest and Police Quest. Uh, yeah, Leisure Suit Larry and King's Quest never went down this route, but 
I hate how it looks, and I really, really hope that um, they <laughs> that these are not as well remembered as some of the other things. Yeah, nine in graphics. Put it at a two in graphics. Looks awful. And I believe this was the last Space Quest game. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Space Quest. I don't know a lot about about Space Quest really. Uh, just that it was a takeoff on all the other Quest games. Hover Force on the Amiga and IBM PC. This is just like an arcade shooter where you wander around a 3D city and shoot hovercrafts. Uh, it's really not interesting at all. It's it's huge. You have a whole city to wander around. It's you know it's in 3D, but all the buildings are bricks and everything. Um, you wander and you shoot. There's nothing. There's nothing to say about it. Strip Poker Three. Yes, advertised in a kid's magazine. And I know they make all this play at, uh, at, ad at you know, trying to cater to adults, too. That they gotta have something in here for adults, but, like, you don't need Strip Poker 3. Come on. Unnecessary. Ah, uh, now we have MT Vic. Uh, this was a company that was very much like Fuji TV. They were an, an off-branch of a Japanese media company that also did uh, TV stuff. So like FCI, but yeah, it, and, and TVIC I had never heard of until this. Uh, yeah, these games, Isolated Warrior and Power Mission. Isolated Warrior is not bad. It's actually like the good version of Silver Surfer for the NES. It's a, so you scroll in a horizontal manner, but you can kind of, you can actually control what you're doing and you don't just run into everything all the time. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not bad. Uh, and then Power Mission is like a turn-based strategy game that's kind of doing a, a battleship style thing. Uh, it's, it's, so it's kind of Advance Wars-like. Uh, you just kind of confront things and then you get, you know, a little screen of, you hit you hit this on this coordinate and all that and yeah it's really not uh, a complex air and uh, boat strategy game next page oh. music is still playing Yeah, uh, so this is the strategies page, and of course I'm not going to go all over all this. But let me just say, trying to teach people the strategies in the game series is just an exercise in pain. Nobody really wants to be good at these games. They just want to look at somebody who's really good at these games being able to show off all the interesting animations and going at ridiculous speeds to uh, complete the challenges. You can't, there's no strategy for these games. You just gotta learn them. Then we have Highway Patrol 2, which is, which is very strange. There does not appear to be a Highway Patrol 1. Uh, I, I looked and I couldn't find it. Yeah, this is a Titus game, um, which it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't look that terribly bad. And you're a cop going around uh, arresting people on uh, Highway Patrol and all that, but it's like, and... Yeah, it doesn't handle, like, the worst out of, uh, PC, uh, uh, racing, first-person racing games out of this time, but it's really, it's really nothing much, and that's what you can say about most of Titus's catalog. Whole lot of nothing much. Now, uh, yes, Interstell, which is a short-lived company, uh, Armada 2525 is an early 4X style game. It really has, like, everything. Um, you know, probably taking off of Masters of Orion. Well, no, no, Masters of Orion was not yet. The one that was before that. The one that Toys for Bob did. I uh, can't remember what it what it's called. But, yeah, it, it's it's got, like, all the things you would want in a 4X strategy game. You know, coming out right at the same time as uh, something like Civilization. I should I should play it sometime, though I don't know... Uh, how accessible it is out there on the web. Now, uh, this game down here, Utah Beach, 
by Atomic Games. Uh, Interstell never actually published it. It was published as V for Victory D-Day on Utah. Uh, so it, it seems to me that, that Interstell went out of business, and then it was sold to this other completely unknown company called 360 Pacific, and they put out the Utah Beach game. And now we talk about some on-the-go games, as they say. Handheld games, but it still hadn't been fully codified yet. Mysterium for the Game Boy is kind of an abstract mix between, like, a wizardry-style game and an adventure game. You know, kind of, kind of deja vu mold, but though I shiver to, to compare anything to deja vu. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it's one of those... Um, games you go around you pick up stuff and you try them on certain things it's all first person you go into in the rooms you see chairs and uh all this stuff you just it's yeah not not a terribly complex adventure game then there was a pac-man port for the atari lynx which i uh, had forgotten about <laughs> i like them trying to get a good lynx screenshot my god that is that is pain right there it is interesting that Namco continued supporting the Lynx. They really didn't like, um... Well, yeah, that, that was Atari games, so, like, yeah. I, I don't know why they would support the Lynx other than the fact that they thought that they it might have a chance, but by 1991, it really didn't. Um, so, yeah, the Lynx, uh, uh... It's a really great... Like, there's some really great games on the Lynx. Uh, but... Pac... Yeah, Pac-Land, such an old arcade game, I'm not sure... not sure why they bothered. Um, Pac-Man is not a direct sequel to any of the other Pac titles. There's no direct sequels in Pac-Man until like Pac-Man, uh, Pac-Man World. <laughs> All other games are just spin-offs of the original Pac-Man, as is Pac-Man. Um, Syriad for the Game Boy. Uh, and I, I, I again didn't look up much about this. It, yeah, this is the one with the ladders. I remember Jeremy Parrish covering this. You like kick ladders around and try to climb up um, the uh, ver various things, the platforms to collect stuff. Um, yeah, the, and uh, at the time, uh, the the company Nexoft was being turned into ASCII Entertainment, uh, so the American arm of uh, ASCII in Japan. Just an an interesting an interesting thing for them to just note in here. Uh, then Mr. Do for the Game Boy. Uh, we talked quite a bit about Mr. Do because it had a kind of interesting role to play in arcades. I don't like it that much. Uh, I would rather play Dig Dug. It is a takeoff on Dig Dug. Uh, the creator himself has admitted that. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's not at all terrible. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's charming in its own little way. And... You know, probably, probably a good fit for the Game Boy, though I have not actually seen the Game Boy version. And then Seek Sneaky Snakes by Trade West for the Game Boy. Uh, this is a game developed by Rare, and it uses the same character used in uh, Snake Rattle and Roll. One of the those unlicensed... Uh, yeah, was it unlicensed? I believe it was an unlicensed NES game. Though developed by Rare, because they could. Uh, no, it was a trade with. They might not have been unlicensed. But yeah, the same character from Snake Rattle and Roll is the one that appears in Sneaky Snakes. Snake Rattle and Roll has an isometric perspective, and Sneaky Snakes is a straight platformer. Dark Man for Game Boy. Uh, this is a game that actually has a lot of interesting visual polish. Uh, so it's a beat em up in the classic style of Double Dragon. And. Like, when you throw people to the ground, the whole screen shakes. Uh, and it's just kind of a, a, a silly, a, a silly beat-em-up with, like, you know, with side-scrolling levels as well. But, uh, you know, side-scrolling beat-em-up. Um, and it's totally playable, actually. It is not, it is by far not the worst beat-em-up on the Game Boy. It actually is kind of responsive. So, yeah, Dark Man uh, by Ocean. Surprisingly enough, not a terrible game. All right, so here's the big kind of uh, feature of this of this magazine. So, gaming, the business of gaming, is the independent software publisher and endangered species. 
So he's talking about some some recent events that are that seem to be trying to squeeze on the smaller publishers in the business. Independent is a very strange term to use because uh, a company like Acclaim was independent, but they were huge. Um, so whatever independent actually means, they, uh, they're, they're talking about the, the smaller time um, publishers. They, they count Tengen in this, and I, I'm not sure I would count them as, as one of these very small time publishers. But Galoob and some stuff on computer platforms. And then they also use this example of Cinemaware. So in, in computer uh, games, Cinemaware was this very renowned uh, studio that made these games with these big, stunning graphics on the Amiga and whatnot, and uh, they went bankrupt because of uh, uh, difficult decisions that they had to make in terms of uh, supporting multimedia software. They backed NEC, and it didn't turn out particularly well. They went out of business, I think, even before uh, the FMV version of It Came From The Desert launched. Uh, so, the, but Cinemaware really was an outlier in this period. Like, the, the, you know, PC gaming goes up and down. And there was definitely consolidation in terms of the big publishers. I mean, today we're in, like, a super consolidation period. And the big, the big people get bigger, and then uh, the middle grade people are never able to get anywhere. But cinemaware was just kind of one player out going out while a whole lot were coming in and especially when cd-rom comes around which you know they would have done pretty well in if that was already the established market uh a lot of the people are gonna do much much better uh and they're gonna they're gonna stick around for a while you know publishers would like take two come out of this period um and you know, a lot of the old publishers are no longer around today. But it was not a it was not a big concern for consolidation in 1991. It only happens later in the 90s when things start to contract. The third and final headline of note is the merger between Broderbund and Sierra. Yeah, that never happened. Uh, so if that happened, maybe it would have been a, an interesting thing to talk about a concern. But yeah, they announced that, and then it never happened. Uh, you can read Ken Williams's book if you want to know a bit about that. But in general, it, it's it's a whole lot of smoke and no fire. Uh, so they were trying to be ahead of a story, but it just didn't wind up being true. Uh, maybe from their perspective, it, it, it felt like there were less people putting out games. But um, no, there was definitely an expansion in the early 90s of people putting out games on all different platforms. You know, they only have, in, in the mid-90s, things start to crash, especially for the uh, computer game market, or for the console market. And now we have uh, Bill Kunkel, the game doctor, giving out some uh, general uh, advice and answers for stuff. Um, so first off, we have uh, a question about the, the NES which is asking, you know, why are some of these early NES games uh, still, you know, like, you know, not nearly as good as these later NES games? And he correctly identifies that there's more chips in it, but he uh, says generally that it's just more memory, and that's not the case, you know, the they're very early on there were games that just had more memory, but they needed these extra chips uh, to kind of, you know, to do different things with the games, especially when we're talking 1991 NES games whole different ballpark than you're talking 85 when it first comes out uh so it's a little bit more complicated than he says memory does help but uh there was a bit more to it uh this ne next one is asking uh about how you know building a computer um this is an older gentleman whose wife is in college um and seeing if uh he can build a computer to play games uh, while also having something that's practical. So, you know, for a, a generally good system, a 286, 12 megahertz is kind of the suggested line uh, there at the moment. And next up, we have a guy who, did, who managed to find some cheats by messing around with his cartridges. Uh, 
Speaking of that fried cartridge, did you notice the red thing you removed had the message do not removed on inscribed in the large letters? So he managed to like get some extra lives by doing a weird short on his cartridge, but he fried his uh coasting goblins uh save battery. Um <laughs> Oh my god, this is, uh, yeah, this is a this is a funny little story. I'm not gonna read the the whole thing. Uh, this poor guy uh, bet on the 2GS, the Apple 2GS, which uh, got some good, like, pretty good game ports for it, but very few. Uh, so, yeah, basically, <laughs> he's telling him, yep, the uh, the 2GS is dead. Uh, better luck next time. And uh, this this last uh, thing here from James Freeport from Worcester, Massachusetts. And yes, that's how it's pronounced. Uh, I grew up right by Worcester. Uh, so... I, I, I don't know a James Freeport. I was not born at the time that this was that this was printed. Um, but good to you, Mr. James Freeport, wherever you are out there in the big wide world. And yes, there's a continuing thing with the uh, with the reviews here. I believe this is the the last review out of the lot. So Faria, a land of mystery and danger. One and again, not one I've never ever heard about before, but it's a very dun uh, Dragon Quest and Zelda inspired game. Uh, very Zelda 2 in its combat style. So very um, fluid, real time combat, but you wander around the world in a very Dragon Quest Final Fantasy fashion. Actually a bit more Final Fantasy than Dragon Quest, now that I think about it. So in the mold of CRPGs, but still trying to be an action game. I don't know how, how good it is. Yeah, Afghan Entertainment's formerly Nexoft. And coming up to the end here, we have Daydreamin' Davy by Hal. And I just find it so bizarre that Hal America was ever a thing. They're, they were such a minor thing, especially pre-Kirby. Because Kirby's not out yet. Um, that I, I, I really want to know what the story with Hal America is. Because I do not get how such a minor player was able to establish an American office or thought it was a particularly good idea. Uh, Daydream and Davy is just like uh, such a boring game. It is uh, really, really not anything special. It has all these various different stages, but the combat is not good and the platforming is very floaty. Yeah, not one of, not one of Hal's greatest accomplishments. Then we have uh, a dual hitter of Namco games for Sega uh, on Game Gear. Batter Up and Pac-Man on Game Gear. You know, again, these are pretty old games. Batter Up is just Family Stadium, but, um, you know, re redone for the Sega system. But of course, Namco was supporting Sega rather heavily because they did not want to support Nintendo anymore. Uh, they had to, and they kept having to until uh, Sony came along. But uh, they were having difficulties with Nintendo and um, whether or not it counted anything towards their exclusivity stuff, they were uh, putting games on the Game Gear and uh, Genesis. And uh, a couple of those games are good. I haven't played uh, Game Gear at all, so I can't tell you whether or not these ones are. And last up, we have Taito's games for the Sega Genesis. Uh, yeah, Taito really had an interesting style for all of their box arts and everything. They really, like, it's really good. I, I think that these are some, the, the standout box art on the, on the, uh, Genesis. Uh, again, I haven't, I haven't played any of these ones, but they seem to have put a lot of strength and quality behind stuff. Taito is not someone you should just forget after kicks or Space Invaders if you're that far behind. But yeah, Space, Space Invaders 91, not nearly as dynamic as stuff like Galaga 88, uh, that series of revamps. Space Invaders has always had a very rocky relationship with the reboot series, especially that one that came out in like 2005 or whatnot. Yeah, that one, that one sucked. So, Space Invaders 91, not nearly as good as uh, something like Galaga 88. And then, uh, Rost and Saga 2 is a uh, very gory beat em up uh, in the style of a bit act razor in a way and a bit uh, altered beast and games like that not for that one on the turbo graphics with the barbarian because that's that's what the character is classic friends lenzetta 
style barbarian generic dude. And then finally, Sagaya. Or Sagaya. Yeah, I should say. It's not Sagaga. It is Sagaya. And it is a very unimpressive Gradius style shmup. It really doesn't have uh, a lot going for it. Though it has underwater sea enemies. So if you're really into shmups for the weird enemies, there you go. Sagaya has. Yeah. Oh, it's a. Oh, it's a spinoff of Darius. Okay. Now it makes sense. Um, yeah, Dur uh, a spinoff of Darius. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, di I didn't even, I didn't even pick up on that. But, that is it, everybody. We are at the very end of computer games and, or, <laughs> video games and computer entertainment September of 1991. I hope you enjoyed this look at this magazine if you would like us to do more of these make sure to uh tell us on the general social media twitter or discord always make sure to join the gaming alexandria discord channel i want to give a great big thank you to everybody again who assisted with the uh fundraiser that we did in uh october to help fund the allocation of uh, court documents from the San Diego Superior Court. I really appreciate uh, everybody who joined in with that, and I hope that I can pay it off very soon in the future. Uh, having to rescan all these back in is quite a task. But I hope you had fun with the reading, and, hopefully, and maybe we'll do some in the future. Uh, a big thanks again to Classic Gaming Quarterly for the general idea and style of this. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.